Okay, and so will this just automatically switch over? Ah, yeah, feels amazing. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm an economist, uh, as, as Allison mentioned, and so this is not my usual crowd. Uh, and so I'm happy to be here and excited about this, this conversation. Um, so I was invited here to talk about uh, policy evaluation and the risk of unintended consequences um, and how, how we should think about those things. Um, green button. Um, so, so I think as, as Paula was just talking about, you know, a lot of our, our, our most pressing policy problems uh, are really complicated. It turns out they're, pro they're problems for a reason. If there were really easy solutions to some of these things, we'd have fixed them already. Um, and, and that's largely because humans tend to interact with those policies in ways that are really inconvenient uh, for, for well-intentioned policymakers. And so I'm going to talk about two um, areas of research that I've personally worked on. There are many, many examples of unintended consequences in the policy space, but I'm going to talk about two here today. One is ban the box policies, and the other is um, broadening access to naloxone. So, uh, so this tale of unintended consequences, number one, ban the box. Uh, cities, counties, and states across the country have, um, have rolled out ban the box policies, which aim to help people with criminal records get jobs. The way that they are designed to work is to um, prohibit employers from asking if a job applicant has a criminal record until late in the application process, um, usually after a conditional offer has been made. And the hope is that that will enable some people who uh, might have been screened out based on checking the box on the application saying they have a record, it allows them to get their foot in the door, maybe build rapport with an employer, um, so that when the employer eventually checks the criminal record, they see the person as a whole person and, and maybe will be more willing, willing to give them a chance. So this policy has been super um, popular. Um, it's, a very, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a popular approach on both sides, and in a lot of criminal justice policy, there's bipartisan effort um, for reform, which, is, which makes it a fun area to work in. Um, but so as of uh, the summer of 2018, the latest, the latest numbers I've seen, Ban the Box is, is in place in 150 counties and cities across the country in 34 states. So this map's a little outdated at this point. So it's a, it's a really popular approach to, to trying to help people with criminal records get back on their feet. Um, the potential problem with Ban the Box is that it doesn't actually address employers' concerns about hiring people with criminal records. There was some reason, um, whether it was well-founded or not, that they were screening people out based on having a criminal record. And so Ban the Box leaves those employers still, not, still reluctant to hire people with records, but now they're not allowed to ask. And when they're not allowed to ask, this might lead them to try to guess who among the job applicants has a criminal record. Um, and in the United States, there are large racial disparities in who has a criminal record and who doesn't. And so uh, this could lead employers to simply avoid interviewing and hiring black men. Um, so this, uh, this policy then has the potential to effectively broaden discrimination to the entire group rather than reducing it. Um, now, I, I, uh, when I present this to economists, this is often a, a laugh line that they're, uh, you know, initially when Man the Box was first proposed, economists warned legislators and, um, and legal advocates about this possible consequence and were told that we don't need to worry because racial discrimination is illegal. So we won't, um, that can't possibly happen in the United States. Um, so now there have been two, two studies, very different approaches to, to investigating what the impact of this type of policy is. The first is by Amanda Egan and Sonia Starr. Um, they did a very nice field experiment in New Jersey and New York City where they submitted job applications from fictitious applicants before and after Ban the Box laws went into effect in those places, randomly varying the race and criminal history of the job applicant. And what you can see is, so this is sort of their punchline graph. I love it when papers have a, um, have a, a figure that kind of tells the whole story. So on the left-hand side, we're pre-ban the box. The blue bars are callback rates for black applicants, and the green bars are callback rates for white applicants. And you can see that there were, um, and on the far left are those who had a criminal rec record, and the, the middle ones um, are with the applicants with no criminal record. And you can see that folks with the criminal history were called, were called back at much lower rates. This was a policy problem that people were trying to solve. Um, but aside from that, there's really no racial gap here, which was sort of interesting and, and different from private, previous studies in this area. Post ban the box, there's a huge racial gap that widens. And this is consistent with the idea that employers are now using race as a proxy for the likelihood of having a criminal record. 
So that paper was really only able to look at callback rates. These were fake applicants, right, um, to, for these jobs. And so the question is, you know, what's the, the net impact in the real world on, um, on racial disparities in employment as ban the box policies are, are rolled out? And so Ben Hansen and I wrote a study um, looking, using the gradual rollout of ban the box policies as a natural experiment. Um, and our main result is that these, the, the, callback, the callback rates, the impact on callback rates that, um, that Amanda and Sonia found are consistent with, with what we're finding on uh, the impacts on actual employment. So Ban the Box seems to have reduced employment for young black men by 3.4 percentage points, which is a 5%. That effect is large, it grows over time. This is not a short-term shock that um, you know, everyone just had to figure out again how to, how to screen for applicants. Um, this seems to be um, a, a major, uh, uh, have had a major long-term effect on employment for a group that was already struggling in the labor market. So the next, um, the next uh, policy and unintended consequence I want to talk about is broadening naloxone access. So um, as you know, people in this room are, are very familiar with, uh, as, as opioid-related mortality has climbed across the United States, many states have tried to um, mitigate the, um, the deadly consequences of opioid abuse by broadening access to naloxone. Um, these maps show kind of the, how quickly the, these laws have gone into effect across the country. Um, and in the best case scenario, there's a standing order. Anyone can walk into their pharmacy, uh, get access to this. Community groups are distributing it for a low cost and, and so on. Now, there's plenty of evidence um, in, in economics, uh, primarily, um, that on the margin, when the, re when the risk associated with doing something is reduced, people are going to do it more often. Right? So a classic example in this area is seatbelts uh, and car insurance. So um, if, if it's uh, if you have seatbelts in your car, you might, be, uh, you might be more likely to drive more recklessly because you know you're less likely to die. Um, another public health example is um, there are some good studies showing that life-saving HIV medication increased risky sex um, and, and incid um, the incidence of, of different uh, sexually transmitted diseases. So these types of um, moral hazard effects are going to cancel out some of the beneficial effects that we might expect from these policies. So in this case, Broad access to naloxone might actually lead to more opioid abuse or to more use of, uh, of more potent opioids, including fentanyl. Um, and, and I think what's really interesting here is that it's, in this context, it's really easy to imagine people miscalculating and being, less, just a little bit, being just a little bit less careful about the source of, or the content of your heroin could easily lead to more deaths rather than fewer. So we sort of a similar design to what we used in the Ban the Box study. We used the gradual rollout of these naloxone access laws across the country to measure the effects on a variety of outcomes related to opioid abuse to try to paint a picture uh, in a context where, you know, the actual uh, uh, outcome data that we really want, risky use of opioids, um, isn't observable, right? So we can see mortality, we can see ER emissions, that sort of thing. And it turns out that the, um, the effects in the Midwest in particular were especially deadly. So you can see... Uh, you know, we have a variety of controls in these models trying to account for pre-existing differences between places and so on. Our, our controls are, are really nicely soaking up all the, any pre-trends that were going on. So we see it's, it's the impacts on um, opioid-related mortality and fentanyl-related mortality is flat before the law goes into effect, and then it starts climbing. So the challenge of doing work uh, in policy-related areas uh, like these is that people really don't like bad news. Um, and, and different people will respond differently to this. Uh, and, you know, we got a lot of pushback to the Ban the Box study, mostly from advocacy groups. And so it launched a lot of interesting conversations um, where we tried to explain you know, research methods and so on. I was, you know, I was expecting the opioid, the naloxone paper to be controversial. I was blown away by how, um, how uh, vicious a lot of the criticism was, especially from the academic community and the public health community. Um, and it was a very different sort of conversation than we'd been having with advocacy groups from the criminal justice uh, space. So, um, you know, there are just some examples of some of the, the pushback we got. A lot of people blame the messenger. We, there's, um, I actually know this guy from college. He wrote this blog post <laughs> in Slate um, and accused us of, you know, not actually accusing us of, of advocating for moral genocide, but the, the term came to mind. Um, uh, it, either we got a lot of feedback on Twitter. Um, one of the more interesting aspects of this conversation was actually how um, the, the econ Twitter um, um, community came together, and there, was, there were so many uh, usually sincere, well, 
uh, many sincere questions, many non-sincere questions also, but um, uh, many sincere questions about the research methods and trying to understand the study. Um, and my co-author and I could not keep up with it all. And so a lot of other economists kind of came in and, um, and tried to explain to folks who were less familiar with kind of the types of research methods that economists use. Um, there's a lot of confusion about, you know, maybe, maybe we're just confusing correlation with causation. Maybe that hadn't occurred to us. Um, and, you know, this is, <laughs> it was very common. Um, and so lots of good, good people like Chris pushed back and was like, oh, it turns out correlation doesn't equal causation. And um, we, we could have a good laugh about it. Um, uh, there were lots of trolls. Um, I got to know the mute, but the mute function on Twitter is super useful for stuff like this. Um, so a lot of people you can just say you hate poor people. Um, uh, and one of the, you know, the, the, the types of responses that I, I, were somewhat laughable and, and, and also you know, serious or you know, this, this fear that policymakers are going to immediately respond to research advice or research findings, which I've done enough research to know like that never happens. Um, but a lot of people were really concerned that our study would be weaponized um, by, by policymakers that were opposed to broadening access to naloxone to begin with. Um, and so we wound up writing up a whole blog post for ESA, which is a, um, a labor econ uh, a group in, in Europe um, that posts working papers and so on. And you know, responding to a lot of the, the, the criticisms and, and concerns that people had, had presented along the way and just to kind of talk through how researchers uh, work in this space. Um, and just wanted to, to read one, one section from that on, on this last point. So many suggested we should never have written a paper that could be easily weaponized by opponents of their preferred policy. We agree that academics have a responsibility to facilitate accurate interpretations of their research. We've tried to do that. But we don't agree that academics should quash research results that don't fit the narrative of one advocacy group or another. And and this point, I think, you know, one of the more gratifying pieces of this whole conversation was how policymakers responded. In subsequent conversations with policymakers and practitioners, we've been gratified that they recognize that even worthwhile policies involve costs as well as benefits. In our experience, decision makers are thinking responsibly about what to do next, and perhaps our critics should get them more credit. Um, I really felt that a lot of the public health um, academics were, uh, had a much more rash reaction to this research than people who are on the front lines um, working in this space, and, and the latter group tend to be much more thoughtful, I think, in their responses to, um, to the research that we're putting forward. So moving forward, I think you know, the, main, the main point that I want to leave you all with is um, we really need to commit to rigorous evaluation, even when it's uncomfortable. Not all policies are going to have benefits. Uh, we should assume that most things we're going to try are going to fail. Um, it just is the reality in, in context um, across, the, across the, uh, the public health space and, and education and criminal justice and all kinds, of, all kinds of spaces. A lot of things that we think make sense and there are obvious solutions are just not going to have the effects that we want because humans are complicated. Um, so we need to be humble. We need to aim to fail quickly. Keep trying until we figure out what works. Uh, uh, you know, in the end, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think we will find solutions to these problems, but like, we're, we're gonna have to fail a lot before we get there. Um, and then we need to recognize that even worthwhile policies are going to involve trade-offs. It's absurd to pretend costs don't exist, um, but the point of rigorous evaluation is to tell us whether the benefits exceed the costs and whether other policies could have larger net benefits. There might be something else that we could do instead that would be a better approach. And understanding those costs, even if it's clear to us that the, the, you know, the benefits are going to outweigh the costs for whatever reason, we, we're omniscient, we know this, this sort of thing, um, understanding what the costs are gives us a chance to come up with a way to mitigate those costs. So it's always better to have that information. And then so the last, my very last point is if we have a policy problem that we think is important, we should work with, work with academics from the very beginning to, to implement it in a way that allows an evaluation. Looking at data after the fact usually doesn't provide the sort of experiment that you need to really test something. Um, so you should, we should always be planning for rigorous evaluation up front to make sure we're doing more good than harm. I'll stop there. Thanks.